הלכות פסח, כ', כ', ח'. שאין נופלים על פניהם בחודש ניסן. This chapter is that we don't fall on our faces the whole month of Nisan, meaning we don't do Tachanun. Uvo bet seifim, there are two seifim here. Ma'an writes, Aleph, Sho'alin b'ilchot Pesach, kodum le-Pesach. We ask about the laws of Pesach before Pesach, Shloshim Yom, 30 days before Pesach. Where do we learn that you have to study the laws of Pesach 30 days before Pesach? The Mishnah Bua says, if you look at the first, Aleph, See, I'm gonna. Those of you who are holding a Mishnah Bua today, let me show you how this works. Because in the Sefer you just tap it and it gives you commentaries. You have here the Be'er Hetev. That's not written by the Chavetz Chaim. That's like a standard commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. Right underneath you have two columns. There's the right column, Mishnah Bua. That's written by the Chavetz Chaim. You have the Bi'ur Halacha. The Bi'ur Halacha is the expansions. Whatever Mishnah Bura doesn't want to elaborate, he makes a footnote in the Bi'ur Halacha. <coughs> And so let's say there's one little detail he wants to zoom in on. He'll zoom in on it on the left column. And then the bottom is Shair Hatzion. This is where he gives his sources. So these three commentaries are the Chavetz Chaim. It's one commentary on another of his commentaries with sources at the bottom. And normal Shulchan Ruchs don't look like this, but this is the Mishnah Bura's commentary on the Shulchan Ruch. So if you look in the Mishnah Bura, there's always going to be the section that says Mishnah Bura on top of it. Aleph. Shualim Bichot Pesach. Shari Moshe Omed Pesach Rishon. You learn this, that Moshe Rabbeinu starts telling them the laws of the second Pesach on the first Pesach. What is second Pesach? Pesach. Yeah, that's a month later. Mm-hmm. It's also the law on other holidays. We teach the laws of Purim, 30 days before Purim, of Sukkot, before... Sukkot? 30 days? Every holiday. Every holiday. Would you say that... that what? That... Um, the Chavetz Chaim wrote all of these three? Yes. Oh. I'm going to ask a really silly question. How come we're learning the Ashkenaz Halacha? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> I'll answer that in just a second. Ayin Bevur HaGra. Look in the commentary of the Gra. Shedato, that his opinion is the Ba'atzeret Sagim Yom Aleph B'Sivan. Which holiday is called Atzeret? Shemini That's called Shemini Atzeret. Which one is Atzeret? It's something to Hashem. Which one is it? Shavuot. The Vilna Gaon says for Shavuot you only have to start a week before on the first of Sivan. Some say that Chiyuv Shloshim Yom Huat be Pesach is only on Pesach. Mishum Diyesh Ben Achot Rabot because there are many halachot at Pesach. But other holidays, even just a few days before, meaning you don't have to have thirty days. Thirty days is because there are a lot of halachot to study before. But any other holiday, just it's proportional to the amount of halachot you have to study before the holiday. Uh, that's probably the emet is like that. And the truth is that, according to everybody, you just have to prepare before the holiday. 30 is not a number you have to get stuck on. Just before every Chag, you should study the Halachot of that Chag. I believe not only the Halachot, also the Machzor, the Sidu. You should have gone through the Machzor and the Sidu, especially Rosh Hashanah Kippur. So at least remember, remind yourself. You've been doing this forever. Remind yourself just the order. When, when, when do we sing uh, this piyut? When do we sing that piyut? When do we do Chazal the Shaz? How long are the pages? To just make everything organized before you go into the holiday, so that you're prepared for the holiday. Normally, mm-hmm. we leave all of the religious stuff up to we're standing by the seder and like, trying to read the little notes and the mafuzot to remember what we should be doing. When do we stand? When do we sit? When do we come? <coughs> but the food we've been preparing for a week, and the clothes for three weeks, and the house we've been for four weeks. What about the halachot? Why do we wait until the day up? That's that's the purpose of zevah. Now, Zev asked a good question. It's not only questions Zev has asked; it's a question a lot of people have asked. <laughs> Why are we doing an Ashkenazi commentary on the Shulchan Aruch? Watch this. I'm going to take a real Shulchan Aruch. Your average page of Shulchan Aruch has on it Shulchan Aruch with a Ramah. Then one commentary, two commentaries, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, eight, more or less. Of all of these, maybe one is Sephardic. What about Moran? Moran is Sephardic. I know, but does, why don't we use Moran? We are. That's Moran. Oh. That's Shukhan Where? Where do you see that? When I read to you, Moran says, Shalim, we've got the, f- the line on top. You lost my dad's first watch. Yeah. Because we normally use this. Well, 
It's a very nice and pleasant commentary. Al Shukhan Aruch Orachim, on the writing of Maran, Shukhan Aruchim. Asher Chiber Hagaon, Rabban Shel Kol Bnei Gona, which the rabbi of all the Jewish people wrote, Moreno Harav Yosef Kairo Zatar. Im Chidushay Dinim, Shishmit Hagaon Hanan, Vim Tsiam Hagaon, Rabbi Moshe Sadish. Along with the halachot that were omitted by Maran and filled in by the Rama. Im Nosek Kirim, and he mentions the three commentaries he quotes. And then yes, the commentary of Mishnah mm-hmm. Borah for the Chavetz Chaim. So when I say Mishnah Borah, that's the commentary in the bottom of the Shulchan Aruch. This just happens to be a very prevalent mm-hmm. set of Shulchan Aruch that you can find in almost every synagogue. Is this one? Not every. For example, in this Thank neighborhood, you. in this neighborhood, I know of one other house aside from mine that has a Shulchan Aruch design, a whole Shulchan Aruch. Mm. Mm. Mishnah Borah is a more common book. Um, it's true. So. On top of that, and here's on top of that, Haraperitz very much enjoys the commentary of the Chavetz Chaim on the Shulchan Aruch. He believes the Chavetz Chaim was very honest and very straightforward in He doesn't view him as binding. In fact, when I read Haraperitz's notes, a lot of it is just writing over Mishnah Boah and then when we disagree with him. Mm-hmm. And essentially that's the book that Dan is holding, is Mishnah Boah. And at the bottom are the footnotes of Mazuz. And when, yeah, and when Sfaradim disagree with Mishnah Bua. Mishnah Bua wrote a very... Which is pretty small. <laughs> it is pretty small. Pretty yeah, sparse. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really there. Mishnah Bua did a very good job. He's not all the time ruling Halachot. Most of the time, he's explaining just what's written on top of Shulchan Aruch. And he did a very good job. At it. And he's very real and straightforward and to the point. And Halach Peretz has a, a big bias towards Mishnah There are some times where Peretz will rule against all the Sfaradim rabbis you might think of. Because the Mishnah Bura says something, hmm. as long as he believes that the Mishnah Bura is saying the truth in what Maran means. Their time Mishnah Bura is not, he's ruling against Shukhan because he's following the Ramah. But in the times where Mishnah Bura is just explaining Maran, and he believes Al-Pel, that he explains Maran better than someone else does, he doesn't care these Ashkenazi. He's, he's telling the truth, he's telling the truth. And hmm. he, we do have, in the laws of Shabbat, for example, we learn a lot of Mishnah Bura in, in the last one. I would love to say that that goes it's a two-way street. In other yeshiva, they learn a lot of our books, but it's not true. Um, someone did put out a set. You know, the problem with Svaladim is we're not so good at putting out sets consistently. They started writing a Shulchan Aruch with all the Sephardic commentaries on it. And they had a volume this big for the first 24 chapters of Shulchan Aruch of all the Sephardic commentaries. So we're talking about the whole, the whole Shulchan Aruch will take you maybe six or seven or eight of those bookcases. Sure. Oh. Unfortunately, those commentaries are just not as accessible to us as other ones are, so we use what we have. There is the Kafachayim, which you were using last time. The Kafachayim is essentially the same idea. It's a Sephardic commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. And we, in our yeshiva, we use them side by side. We study Shulchan Aruch with those two commentaries. That's when we're going fast. Like when we really want to learn in depth, so we go to the Gemara, to the sources. But when we just want to read Shulchan Aruch and breeze through it, we use the Mishnah Bua and the Kav Chaim parallel to each other. Yeah. Uh, I just happen to own many different versions of the Mishnah Bua, so that's why I have a few books to bring around. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I figured we'd use that one. How are they and they all have the same page number. What? How are they doing different versions? Well, no. This is a set that I donated to the shul, so it's here. This is my set, and that's an extra set that I, I had. Um, I used to have one in my house and one in my office, when I had an office. So that... Set also in my house. The one that Dan is holding has the notes of Rabbi Mazuz. There's another one I have at home with the notes of Rabbi Nevin Sal, the chief of Ashkenazi rabbi of the old city of Jerusalem. And a few different sets of okay. Mishnah Bura, but these are the ones I brought. Hmm. All right. So we learned a lot of Pesach. Thirty days before Pesach. What is thirty days before Pesach? Right after Purim. Right after Purim. Or Purim right before. Look at the second Mishnah Bura. Bet Shloshim Yom Matchilim Yom Apurim Atzmo. You start on Purim itself. Okay. Every year, in my Purim Suda, I bring up something about Pesach. It's Kippur Yod, it's Shabbat Gadol, it's because you have to start learning the laws of Pesach and Purim. Purim, okay. Tell out all the people who are partying. Someone said you have to drink on Purim so much that you won't remember that Pesach is four weeks from now. <laughs> 
just the opposite. That's what they said. I said, Chaval, because you know, if you learn Pesach with us, you won't have to drink so much. It'll be okay. <laughs> and now he says that there's a custom on Shabbat Gadol to teach all the halakot of Pesach, and that's when they're done. And the hangover when you lose a week of study. <laughs> and I believe that really it's your job now, between now and Pesach, these few classes we're going to have for Pesach not enough, to go learn the laws of Pesach and you know, whatever books you have in Halakha. Learn them. Uminhag liknot chitim. And there's a custom, that is the Rabbah, Siyanta. Uminhag al chitim. There's a custom to buy grains. For, now we're on the next page. Lechalkan laniim litzoch Pesach. To give them to poor people for Pesach. Grains. Wheat. So they can make them lots of? It says in the bottom of page Bet. In our countries, we give them flour. Why flour? We, it's, it's more useful to give a poor person flour than it is to give them grains. The grains, they have to go grind them up and make flour out of it. Right. Flour, they could really make food for Pesach with it. Is that, is that practical to, to do to nowadays? No. <laughs> Kevin, what are we talking about? Yeah. Why would giving poor people a bunch of flour before Pesach... That's like getting rid of your chametz. Why are you giving... Why are you, someone the day before Pesach dropped off 100 pounds of flour in your front door. you kill them. Your wife would kill them. Well, but I guess they'd use it to make matzah. That's right. Kevin, yeah. you know how much people pay for matzah nowadays? <clears throat> oh, yeah. How much is a pound of matzah? Shmur matzah. Shmur matzah. Let's say shmur matzah, because that's the... Oh. Forty? Yeah, there's supposed to pay forty bucks. Sure. Used to be so. In San Diego, they pay like you can pay fifteen dollars. That's very cheap. In New York, you can't find fifteen dollars more a month. Mm. Thirty dollars, thirty-five dollars. Nice. I was once in place sixty dollars. Wow. If you want to buy soft matzah from New York, ninety dollars. Mm. How is matzah? Matzah is supposed to be easy, simple food. Yeah. You have flour. <laughs> right. You have water. It's not very complicated. <laughs> Every day you wake up, you Four roll a bread. cup of flour with some water, you throw it in your fire, you make yourself bread, and that's what you eat. That's the whole thing of Pesach. It's the bread of poor people. Why are you paying 60 bucks for bread of poor people? Yeah, that wouldn't be simple. So you have to make it yourself. <laughs> it says in the Torah, parched grains. Parched. Roasted to the point where they can't. Okay, that's something else. That's. Uh... I was wondering what that... Once you, you parch <coughs> the grains, once you roast the grains, they can't be baked anymore. That's something, this is, it's there also, it's in the red, the same. So it's like puffed rice or something? Mm, no, it's like, um, I don't know, we don't really do it uh, so much nowadays, yeah. it's not something. I'm just wondering what it was in, in terms of. <coughs> That's a good question, I don't know. When it comes to matzah, though, it's very cheap. It should be, uh, how much does flour cost? I don't know, how much, is, what is the average pound of flour nowadays? 25 cents. 25 cents? Is it dumb? Really? Yeah. Uh, the little one no, two on. pound bag. If you buy the five pound bags, yeah. those cost like six ninety nine. But that's not the real price of flour. Yeah. And when you buy that same brand of flour in a wholesale place for food, listen, I, I'm not talking organic flour. When I go, let's say, to Costco business and I stock up for Yashan flour for peasant for for the year, so I buy fifty pounds of flour. Fifty for maybe thirteen dollars. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. that's what it should be. That's very Don't cheap. Flour is very cheap. I think it always has been, basically. Yeah. yeah. You pay more when you buy... It's like everything in retail. You pay more when you buy... Uh, the smaller it is. But still, it's not... No, I'm, pay, I'm buying now shmur amounts of flour. So shmur amounts of flour, I'm paying like two and a half dollars a pound for the amount, shmur amounts of flour. Okay, but these guys, they are... You, know, you don't have to have shmur amounts of flour. It's not haha. But if I'm already working and making handmade matzah, I might as well throw in... So... You have guys going out down to Yuma, Arizona, and right. watching the fields. Yeah. So that's why before. we're paying two and a half dollars a pound. <coughs> Where does that come we're, from? We're paying their salary. We're going to learn about that. Yeah. We're paying their salary. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's not a very expensive food, even if you're paying two and a half dollars a pound. You could just buy a sack yourself and make matzah every morning. What we've done in the Jewish community is told people, oh, we can't trust you to make matzah 18 minutes. You bake matzah with me. It's one hour class that I give on how to bake matzah with me. You bake a matzah with me for one day, you'll learn how to bake matzah already. After that, you can do it in your home every morning. Already there are places that have a minhag not to bake a matzah on Pesach, because maybe it will become chametz. So they bake all the matzah before Pesach. But you can imagine they're eating stale bread by the time seven-day Pesach rolls around. Of course not. In Yemen, by the way, they used to add salt to the matzah. Your father-in-law does salty matzah, or not? I don't. You don't? I'm not aware. Many communities don't. 
corn. Well, I didn't, uh, okay, there's, uh, there's an argument about this, because maybe salt too. makes the bread rise faster. The Yemites believe that how could HaKadosh Baruch Hu make us, it, bread of affliction is one thing, but terrible tasting bread is another thing. <laughs> At least it should have flavor to it. And they believe it's part of the mitzvah of Pesach to make the bread taste good. But it shouldn't take you um, a lot of money. I mean, anyone who can't afford, uh, listen, machine matzah changed the, the shape of everything. matzah for all. I mean, you can buy texture, everything. Yeah, everything is smoother, everything is faster, everything is cleaner. And how much do you pay for a box of machine matzah? It's not a lot of money. Okay, it depends on what you buy, that's fine. But how much? You're still not paying $40 a pound, right? Right. No, you're not even $18 no, a pound, you're not paying. No, no. So, today there is a way, but in the communities especially, where they insist they should only have handmade shmura matzah, there are communities like this, they insist on that. And who's being very strict about them, in my experience? Most of the time, the people who don't have enough money to be strict about these things. Like, you know, you're rich, you want to buy a 40 pound, $40 matzah, you can do whatever you want, buy as much as you want. But when you have 25 kids, and you're collecting money from people, and you're, still, and you're, not, able to, you're not able to make ends meet, and already you spend all the money you need to be spending on all your <coughs> regular bills just on matzah for Pesach. That's a crazy thing. Are we going to be doing most of it too? So that this, this whole thing, yeah, we will be. I mean, this, not learning, but doing it. Yes. What is that? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. This money of giving flour to poor people oh. is called ma'ot chitim, the money of flour. We give people flour, so even that the poor people don't have to spend. The Shabbat says that if they don't have what to bake matzah with, then of course... You should give him the money that it would take to bake his matzot or buy his matzot. And that's what we call ma'ot chitim, the money of flour. <coughs> and we make a collection, and that money we give to families who need food for Pesach. A lot of times, those families are even in our community. They say the miracle of uh, Pesach is how your 30 day salary goes out of your pocket before eight days are up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the miracle of Pesach. We collect them yeah, we collect them here. And look what the Ramah says. Who is obligated to give, to contribute to the money of the poor people? Kol mishadal be'ir. Yud bet chodesh. If you live in a city for 12 months, tzarich liten l'zeh. You must donate to the communal fund. Meaning, if you become a resident of the city in which you're obligated to pay money for the people of the city, once you've lived there for 12 months. That makes you a resident, yeah. Yeah, Mishnah Boaz says that if you move for good, even though you weren't there already for 12 months, but your intention is to stay there, we already can tax you for this. See, a lot of times there were collections for people. But everyone said, I don't want to give, I don't need to give. I don't. There are Jewish communities that part of the rule was that they simply taxed you. You have to give. It's not a choice not to give to poor people. <clears throat> you have an mm-hmm. attitude, and a lot of it is because we live here in the United States. If you study social studies a little... There was a time in, in history where we started deciding, they call it the, the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. There started to become calculations of who deserves charity. So for example, it's something normal in the world where you'll say, you know, a person who has a disability who can't work, uh, they deserve to get you know, government aid. But somebody else, they don't deserve to get government aid. Why? Because you can't see their disability. Mm. It's a lot. You see, if you, the number one complaint to people who park in a handicapped spot, and their <coughs> handicap is not a physical, at least not visibly physical, that they get a lot of people scream at them. Ah, wait, wait, you can walk in your world, park in the handicaps. Hand, the only handicap is not just walking. So there are other handicaps in the world. But this attitude of, I can decide based on, I don't know which information you have, to determine this person deserves charity and this person doesn't deserve charity. This person deserves food stamps and this one doesn't. This person deserves medical insurance and this one doesn't. We make those decisions without any... You know, there's a reason why in this country when you try to get on a government program, you have to be eligible. Now, you could argue that the eligi- el- eligibility requirements or those people who oversee who should be getting on has to be improved. You can make that argument. That's a fair, you have a right as a person who donates money. Your taxes are a, a tax that you give. You have a right to demand that the system change, yes, but not that you should determine that people don't deserve. This tzedaka is tzedaka. The community has people who are responsible for determining who gives, uh, who receives, and you, your job is to give. If there's a community, this community is run by Tamil Khamim, and this Tamil Khamim have people who work for them, who know the financial situation of the people in the town, you don't have a right to say, oh, I'm not giving. You live in a community, you belong to that community, you can be taxed by that community. <coughs> we don't live in a Jewish community anywhere near as functional as that. We don't live. Imagine 
Imagine if before the holidays, every, this happened in Morocco, for example. This was the part of the rules. The Bedi knows how much money you make. The Bedi also knows how much money you spend. The Bedi knows what you pay for your children, what you pay for school. What you pay. The Bedi also knows that there are people who have a lot of money, people who have less. You get a letter once a year telling you that your tax to the Jewish community is this amount, depending on all the, all the numbers that they've worked out. You give your tzedakah to the Bedin, and nobody collects from you for the rest of the year. Mm. Because you have given your tzedakah. And the Bedin decides, listen, you're wealthy, you're going to give a lot more money in tzedakah. <coughs> and you're nuts. Then you're not, you might not even give in. You might, you might be eligible to join the list of people who receive. And in such a place, nobody's knocking on your door begging for money. Nobody's going around the synagogue begging for money. Because there is a central place that the, the community trusts. That's the big key here. It's not a bunch of bullies who, who take your money. The community trusts, hey, do my job for me. That's like here. It's the most similar to here, Rabbi. Take this money, Matan Levinim. When you give me money from Matan Levinim, you're trusting me that I'm not putting it in my pocket and walking away with it, right? But that you wouldn't give matanot of your name to anybody who knocks on your door. You're gonna feel, this is gonna go on both Hashem. This year we're able to give a significant amount to people. So that's Malchirin. We have a mitzvah to give money to Tzedakah. Let's see the second halacha. We don't do the whole month of Nisan. And we don't say Tzedakah at the Shabbat of Nisan. We don't say Tzedakah at the Shabbat of Nisan. Why do we say Tzedakah at the Shabbat? Because that's when the souls return. That's right. The world. And now is not a time. It also, the David HaMelech passed away in Mincha, in the time of Mincha on Shabbat. So, Tzidchat is like Tzidu Kadim. We uh, accept judgment on ourselves. In Nisan, we don't do that kind of stuff. Then must be Dinbo. We don't eulogize on it. My grandmother's your side is in Nisan. And there's nothing you can do. You can't eulogize in Nisan. Then <coughs> Mitanim I always ask people, so then share a story about their life that could teach us a message. Don't so eulogize we, them. So, we don't do Hashkabahs? Okay, hashkavahs are their own. Do we do hashkavahs on Shabbat or not? <coughs> yeah, you can do hashkavahs. Yes, yeah, but not. My mother's. We don't. We don't start saying, "Oh, crying about our dear aunt Betsy," and, we, and the, that's not proper for Nisan. It's a time of joy. Then we tanimbo laskil betzibu, and we don't fast during Nisan. Nisan. What does it mean? An individual is allowed to fast, according to Malan. But you can't announce a public fast in Nisan. For the firstborn. Okay, well, that's right. That's right. That b'chod mitanim b'vel pesah. But the firstborns can fast on the Eve of Pesah, or they do fast. Now he's going to talk about this in chapter four hundred and seventy, I believe. Tough. Right. Mm-hmm. going to talk about fasting. We're going to get to the firstborn. It's a fascinating halacha that one. How it's become what it has become today. Uh, gam. I mean, essentially, it's not really fasting because we, we push it off anyways with a siyum of some. So what what really is the whole deal with that fast? We'll get there. Rama argues. Gam enomim tzidu kadim b'chol shizan. Rama says that we don't say tzidu kadim. Well, it could be according to Rama, he doesn't let uh, Ashkabas, but I don't know. V'nagu she'em etanim botanit klal, and the custom is we don't do any fasts during the month of Nisan. Afid yom shemet bo aviv oimo. Even the day that his father and mother pass away, meaning a yort site, the custom of Ashkabas is to fast on the yort site of a parent. Absolutely. Yeah. It's one of those Ashkenazi customs that the Hasidim don't do, and therefore the Ashkenazim forgot that they do. But there are Ashkenazim, the day that the parents are outside, there's no eating, no drinking, uh, yeah. where a kittel, sometimes all kinds of different minhagim that are found. Yeah. It's an old, it's mentioned in old sources. Look, the Ramaz mentioned it. But a private fast, like for a bad dream, we fasted. It's interesting why he says that. According to some poskim, when you fast during the Ramadan Nisan, you have to make up that fast. In the, you have to fast another day in the year to for, do a forgi- to get forgiveness for fasting during Nisan. Hmm. Uh, but he says when Rama says that you're allowed to fast a fast of the dream, he's telling you I mean, you're allowed to do it and you don't have to make up for it in the year. So These are all these things that you don't say be'erev Pesach and we eat a little bit more and drink a little more the day after the Chag. Vuhu Isruchag, and it's called Isruchag. Okay, that's that's that. There's not a lot of meat over here in the halacha. Let's very quickly at the top of the page, and we'll end for today. Uh, uh, the next section, Taf Lamid, Uvos Ifachat. There's one halacha here. Shabbat Lifnei Pesach, the Shabbat before Pesach. Kolin Otom Shabbat Gadol. We call it Shabbat Gadol. Lifnei Hanes Shnasabu because of the miracle that happened there. 
says the Ramah, v'minhag lomar b'mincha ha'agada mitchilat avadim ha'inu ad chaper kol avonotenu. And the custom in Ashkenaz is to say the Haggadah, most of the Haggadah on Shabbat Agadol. I only know, I've only said Chabad to that custom. But I'll tell you the truth, is that I haven't hung around a lot of Ashkenazi communities around Pesach. So it could be that many Ashkenazi communities do it, I just have never seen it. And we stop saying Barachin Nafshi. Okay, what's the big miracle that happened on Shabbat Agadol? <coughs> remember you tell us about this, and I can't remember. Very good, let's look at this. <laughs> let's look at the... Passover, <laughs> By the way, the Vilna Gaon writes that he didn't do it. He didn't say the Haggadah. On, hmm. So it could be that's where the Hashem was going to get the Chassidim not to do it. And hmm. it makes sense the Chassidim would not listen to the Vilna Gaon. Yes, that in an ironic twist of fate, that's how it ended up happening. So what's the miracle? The Mishnah says, When the year that we left Egypt, the tenth of Nisan came out on Shabbat. And we each took a, 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 a no, let's say, which animal? Uh, lamb. No, lamb. Lamb. And we tied it on the doorpost. No lamb, yeah. Not the doorpost, the bedpost. Uchmash katuv basur achodesh. Okay. Vamitzrim rauze, and the Egyptian side. Veshalu lama zelachen. So what are you doing with these animals? Veshivah leshachtam neshama pesach bematzvat Hashem alenu. We're gonna kill them. We're gonna slaughter them because Hashem told us for pesach. And they were very upset that we were killing their gods. But they didn't say anything to us. They couldn't say anything to us. Then something held them back spiritually from attacking us on that day, that even though we were poking their eyes out. And that was the big miracle that happened. And it's for that reason that Ashkenazim have a custom to read the Haggadah on that Shabbat, because that's really when the miracle began. The moment we began to lift up our heads against the Egyptians is the moment when the miracle began. And it's for that reason that the Ashkenazim have a custom to say the Haggadah then. The Gaon of Vilna learned out from a Pasuk that you're not allowed to say the Haggadah before Pesach. That's why he had that custom. But uh, to each their own amount. It's a good thing, like I said, to prepare anyways things for Pesach. It sounds like the not eating matzah before Pesach. Right, it sounds like it. Uh, but that in the Gemara, that's in the Gemara the day before. 30 days before, that's the custom. And we're going to continue tomorrow.